just a reminder just a reminder that i do record these sessions and it will be posted on youtube so that it's a a, a resource for us to return back to and uh, and obviously for other people to share people are watching us in different time zones and so not everyone is able to attend live hello to shanaz who is um flying home from india uh right now um well, we've lost Stella as well. So anyway, people come and go. I hope people, uh, yeah, so f firstly to welcome Silas uh, Muambegi, M Muambegu, if I hope I'm saying that right. It's greetings to you, Silas. Um, from Mombasa, I understand, and also part of uh, an interesting Farmers support support group, and we'd love to hear something from you later on. So, not to put you on the spot now, but when you're ready, do we? We're going to love to hear more about your organisation. So, welcome to. I'm not quite not quite on time, but anyway, welcome to part six of the sector thirty nine permaculture design course. We've tried to do it, trying to do it this way um, to make this content as available as possible to many different people. As the course progresses, we're going to hear a lot more from you, from um, seeing images and hearing stories about what you're doing in your communities, the challenges you're facing, um, how you're using permaculture ethics, uh, 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 principles techniques design tools um to you know to, to face those challenges and um we we just to to, to bring people together is permaculture is a pattern language and it's a way of thinking and it, it's quite a methodical way of thinking and it leads us to design so that we are creating things with intention. Um, this, this, uh, many different people, permaculture has been around since the 1970s. The word was coined um, by two writers and teachers in the 1970s, in, actually in Australia. But, the, but as a concept, it's bounded around, the, bounced around the world. Many, many people have been playing with it now, 30, 40 years of history and the threads that kind of bind it together, permaculture, is really the core ideas as articulated by Bill Mollison in his Permaculture Designer's Manual, the book over on my shoulder there. And a few years later, David Holmgren, the co-author, came up with his book, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability. And he, he gave us permaculture as three ethics, 12 principles, and a set of design tools. And I, I really like David's 12 principles. And I kind of, for me, it's like the hours of a clock or the months of the season. And you can imagine how these 12 principles kind of flow into, in, into a continuous cycle. And so that's very much how I like to, to sort of, it helps me order my thoughts. And also as a teacher, it helps me think about the sequence of how to put my training sessions together and how to, how to, you know, to think about these sessions. and sort of help me remember where we're at, if you like, in, in the narrative. So principle 12, sort of midnight, midday, the, 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 the start of the cycle is, a, is about change and the inevitability of change. Um, and um, it also tells us though, is that because change is inevit inevitable and uh, nature's constantly in motion is there are constantly new opportunities and there are flows of energy that may come at different times and in different places but that we can tap into to um to, if you like to fuel our designs so change can be scary change can be difficult but change also creates opportunities how do we navigate ourselves through change will we observe and interact we, we, we use our eyes and ears we use our um intellect ask questions um 
we, we, we can look around to see what resources are, what are the challenges, what things are working, what things aren't working so well, um, what changes could we make, what information do we need to improve. Um, so we say we move from this cycle of change to observe and interact. Our first objective, and this is what we've been talking about on the PDC so far, when we observe nature, when we allow nature to be our teacher, when we allow nature to inform us, what we see is going on around us is summarized by the statement, catch and store energy. Um, David Holmgren reminds us that the only new energy coming into the system is the energy from the sun and nature organizes itself photosynthesis plants surface area to trap that energy and to channel it turn it into sugars and carbohydrates and then plants use these stored forms of energy to manipulate influence interact with all the other species around which maintain the right environment for the plants for the trees um plants catch and store energy for the purposes of obtaining a yield and that yield is the more tree more leaves more seeds more nuts the, the food that feeds the soil microbes and the soil fungi these are yields and um we've been thinking about these as processes so we say that the third principle is obtain a yield we're reminded you can't work on an empty stomach we have to feed ourselves and then and also make sure every element in the system is fed for that system to be able to go on and, uh, and be successful. So in this session, I thought, let's, let's think a little bit more deeply about the nature of yields and what they are, and then also strategies to maximize, maximize yields. So I'm going to start with that, and I'm going to start thinking about... Um, about plants and growing systems and apply thinking about our strategies to maximize yields. Okay. Um, we welcome questions and comments. Otherwise we just tick along. Uh, how we go, how we go. Okay, and if you're not contributing, we're welcome to contribute, but if you are uh, not, then try and keep your microphone off so we don't get random noises. Okay. Um, as permaculture designers, we aim to maximize the return from each resource. We're trying to use design thinking so that we, we, we do the minimum amount of work. We do the minimum input required that creates the maximum output. Um, if we're doing a task, whatever that task is, and it's laborious and heavy and the return is very small, we're probably doing it wrong. Um, permaculture kind of teaches us that, you know, hard work is a symptom of bad design. If we're, or we're throwing resources, we're throwing money at solving a problem, we're not really solving the problem, we're, we're kind of feeding it. So how to maximizing the return from every resource? You know, anyway, let's, let's there's a lot of examples of this, I'm going to jump around in, in, into it, but um, I'm going to start thinking about growing strategies. And it's, yeah, we can apply this thinking to anything, but you know, many of us are, if not farmers, we're gardeners or we're small scale growers. And that represents quite a lot of work. It represents materials and effort that we're putting into it. And we want to get the maximum return. And permaculture really helps us to do that and to think about how we organize things strategically so we get multiple benefits because we're interested in linked together integrated systems because we're allowing nature to be our teacher nature doesn't give us monocultures nature give us gives us polycultures 
Nature doesn't just group together annual plants, it mixes together plants that live a long time, plants that live a medium time, plants that live a short time. We mix the nature, these are lessons we get when we observe nature. Okay, I'm kind of paraphrasing and trying to summarize because I'm aware we have some kind of late comers, but I do encourage you to go back and look at the early lectures and there's also resources to download from the academy uh, website again links are placed around so let's go let's start from the whole beginning and i guess it, we're just coming into the new growing season here in the uk so here we are it's february the 7th it's cold outside it's frost on the ground a few perennial plants have already started to germinate and and come back but but um seeds too cold for seeds to start germinating so we're at the beginning of the cycle so let's just think about strategies to maximize yields. Well, the whole growing process, especially with our, you know, well, with our annuals and our vegetables begins with the seeds. Seeds can be expensive. They can be hard to get hold of. Um, our choice of seeds and our choice of the variety of the plant that we are going to grow, the variety of that particular plant, can make every difference to the quality of our eventual outcome. So it's worth paying attention to every detailed part of the whole process. Now, where we don't have choice or we have very limited choice, we might have to go with just what's available. But think about you know, seeds that are produced commercially um, at the F1 hybrids, crossbreds, seeds, uh, um, the plants that you can't save the seed from are growing for a particular set of reasons. And they can uh, have new varieties, they can be disease resistance and strong growing, but maybe they don't satisfy other potentials like saving seed for, you know, for future generations. So actually, to learn, to begin to think a bit more about our own seed saving, the first lesson to learn is that actually some plants some types of plant are much easier to save than others. And what's always good in permaculture, what we suggest is start with the easy ones. So um, tomato seeds are quite good to save. We could go into this and in, beans and peas are quite good to save, but maybe we should go into this a bit more detail further on. But um, let's just keep thinking. Um, our choice of variety of seeds. So um, we, by say, seed saving and by being selective about the variety of seed that we're growing, we might be growing um, types of plants that are suited to where we are, to suited to our soil uh, types, um, soil conditions, and and obviously our sort of local climate. So these are all considerations. Um, organic seeds, um, more the type that you saved yourself, the more the type that are locally adjusted, also tend to not all ripen at the same time. They have a much longer ripening period. And for small farmers and gardeners, that's really useful because we don't necessarily want all of our produce on the same day. Whereas commercial growers, that's a very, very big consideration for them. They want all of their tomatoes or their onions to be ready at the same time so they can harvest, crop, and take to market. So right from the beginning of the whole growing process, you realize there's, ooh, there's choices involved, there's plans, there's strategy. Um, the, you know, the, the, the types of seeds that we're selecting and the varieties and the source of where they've come from, all of that might affect you know, the long-term sort of trajectory of our growing plan. Maybe it's just worth mentioning right at the beginning as well is that when a seed first germinates and that first little shoot comes out, that's really when it's at its most vulnerable. Uh, changing too much, too wet or too dry, it's going to die. Um, a, a, an insect or a pest comes along, a small, you know, disturbs it even a little bit and, um, and it can die. So once we've thought about the seeds and the variety and where they've come from and, 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 and the characteristics of that seed, we might want to work to put it out. First strategy might be to create a seed bed. Let's create the ideal conditions 
for that seed to germinate and I, where I can keep an eye on it. So let's, I'm gonna have my seabed close to my house in my zone one, um, because then I can keep an eye on it and watch, see when it needs watering and I can protect it from being um, attacked perhaps by insects or birds or, or any other potential, um, <clears throat> potential threat. And then I can then think about once the plants are germinating, about transplanting them into a dedicated place where they're then going to grow. <clears throat> it's worth mentioning, some types of plants are very happy being transplanted, they don't mind. And other kinds of plants, actually, it, it, it really knocks them back and disturbs them and stresses them. <clears throat> and generally, it's the root crops, it's the plants with a deep tap root <clears throat> that don't like to be moved. So these are all, <clears throat> this is all informing our strategy about how we maximize our yields. We choose the right kinds of seeds, we germinate them in their ideal conditions, and then we create <clears throat> the right kind of nursery bed or, or, or growing on bed for the types of plants that we're creating over there. Fast growing, you know, uh, uh, herbaceous plants like vegetables, or whether they're long-term plants growing like trees. So, um, strategies to maximize yield. We just need to be a little bit um, thoughtful. I'm going to, these are, these are terms which we will use again and again and again on the, on, or, or throughout the PDC. And when we go and look at different examples um, and we see the work of what's going on in different places, we might use these words to describe what we're seeing. So growing strategies, we've thought a bit about our seeds and, and germinating them and then getting them ready. So we might prepare <clears throat> raised beds. We might create dedicated areas for growing our plants. And we might do this in a very strategic way. Um, for example, by removing the soil from paths and then piling up into the bed, we're doubling the depth of the A horizon. We're creating, we're concentrating on creating the right conditions to favor the plants that we're growing. And if we're growing vegetables, then we want an open, aerated, fertile, moist soil. And we want a good depth of it, at least well, if we have 30 centimetres, then we can grow anything we want in that. In that. <clears throat> and we do that by building raised beds and building the soil up on top and then protecting that soil and all the time with a mulch, a mulch being a cover of dead plants, plant matter. That plant matter that's slowly breaking down, holding moisture, the surface of the soil, and obviously slowly releasing nutrients to the soil microbes and maintaining the right conditions for your plants to grow. Part of our growing strategy might be no dig, or the next one, minimum tillage. <clears throat> it's not always plant, possible to grow plants with a, all the time with a no dig, especially root crops. But what we learned from when we looked at soil, um, under the heading of catch and store energy, we begin to understand that soil is a huge store of energy and we're interacting with that um, store of energy to, to be able to, to, to grow our plants. So we don't want to disturb the soil any more than we have to to do the cultivation. So again, when we make dedicated raised beds, we might disturb the soil and move it around, but we're not going to do it again. And then we're going to keep it mulched and protected. We're going to either mulch it with dead material or we're going to use green manures. We're going to use plants that we grow. Sometimes you might call them cover crops. Green manure cover crops are plants that we grow to feed the soil and to protect the soil. Um, we can think about the microclimate around our beds. Do we need extra shade? Can we construct a shade to reduce evaporation, increase uh, water retention? Um, using our uh, observe and interact, let's be really conscious of how hot and dry the environment is that we're growing. 
and understand the harsher, the more uh, uh, exposed, then we need to create shelter. So our design of our raised beds and the shading on our raised beds will be informed by the conditions that we're growing in. Observe and interact, catch and store energy, obtain a yield. There are strategies for wicking beds, beds that will use um, uh, uh, the fact that water will wick through certain materials to maintain humidity. And obviously, we've touched already on swales, soakaways, you know, larger landscape systems that, that channel surface water to catch it, slow it down and make it sink in. Um, we're going to be compost making. We're going to talk about compost um, a lot going forward throughout the course. And we're going to try and, and today as well, I'm going to understand a little bit more about compost and compost making. Um, we'll begin to touch on biochar as a strategy and using biochar as an addition to your soils. And um, we'll also talk about water catchment and with roofs and tanks. And I think we touched on that a little bit as well. But I was, as I repeat certain things again and again, is the easiest and cheapest place to store water is in the soil. And you only really need to store water above the ground. So for perhaps for nursery beds and for drinking water. So we, the water we store above ground is of immensely higher value because we can obviously use gravity to flow it. The water that's in the soil we need it to stay there so it can nourish plants. And we do that by keeping the soil covered and keeping it mulch, keeping living plants there. So these are growing strategies. These are what these, these are all and you might begin to think about how these all of this kind of thinking might come together to be able to greatly improve our outputs, to be able to build, build systems are much more resilient than the ones we're currently working on. So you think about permaculture is this journey, these 12 steps of thinking. I think how these ideas now begin to kind of jostle and fit together to create a greater whole. I'm going to show you some examples of, the, of these as well later on today. So don't, don't worry too much, but I want you to become familiar with these terms. And when we talk about them, we can, you know, we really understand why they're so important. But these, these are really important, central to our strategies. This is what we're trying to um to, to constantly increase and constantly improve on in our growing systems um i saw this nice graphic today um a, a, a friend of mine anna lock if you're listening anna um shared this uh, five top tips for choosing trees and i thought about fruit trees i thought about how in our gardens and growing systems and fields and field edges, how we might want to stack in different types of yield. And that sometimes the presence of different kinds of plants adds to the total yield. You know, trees provide a bit of shade. Trees um, can provide, you know, mulch and other uh, nutrient cycling, feeding other insects and birds are part of the nutrient cycle. So let's think about integrating trees into systems Here's a few tops, top tips for maximizing the yield from your fruit trees. Spend some time thinking about what you would like to eat or make. There's no point in growing stuff that you don't want to harvest. Um, explore all the beautiful varieties of the fruit you would like, especially heritage and local varieties. Now, um, Paul Agola there in Kenya, he, he he's just been doing a lot of mango tree uh, propagating. He's been doing uh, grafting and using that as again as a tool to share um, quality uh, material across his community and to boost, obviously, um, to create a large yield of mangoes. Um, choose the right size of tree for your space, small, medium or large rootstocks. OK, we can talk about this a little bit more later on. There's two kinds of fruit trees, essentially. There are ones grown on their own root, just grown from the, the pip or the stone. And then there are ones which have been grafted. And grafting is a technique which allows us to set the final size of the tree 
and also the, the variety of fruit. So that's an interesting thing. We'll talk about that a bit more. Um, if you, so this is this is this is more of a Western uh, 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 top tip. But by rather than buying fruit trees, established fruit trees in pots, if you buy them in the winter when they're dormant, uh, you can move them bare rooted, and they're a lot cheaper. Um, and the fifth tip is to, is 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 maximizing yield by shaping the tree, exploring how the shape of the tree can be set by uh, pruning and by uh, uh, training branches so that it captures and stores the maximum amount of the sun's energy and provides the most amount of fruit. So there's techniques, there's details about how we can maximize the yield on fruit trees, by understanding how they grow, the shape, the varieties, um, the, the, the timing when to when to move them and to plant them, and to think about the varieties that we actually want to use ourselves or might have the highest value in our local market or community. So it's like a checklist thinking about how we um, maximize yields. Okay, look, I put in a little picture here. This is an apple tree, but this could be a mango tree if you're in the tropics. This could be, um, and let's just have a quick look at here. So this part of the tree here is what we call as the rootstock. That's the, that has come from one source and one plant. And these two pieces of wood here, we call the scion. Um, that, that, wood that variety of plant have been selected for the fruit so the rootstock sets the vigor of the tree by vigor we mean how fast and how big it's going to grow uh, the more vigorous the bigger the tree the bigger the tree the more we can't reach the fruit and they go up high in the sky the more we need to the further apart we need to space the trees to allow that space um if we have a, 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 a smaller rootstock, a dwarfing rootstock, the tree grows with less vigor. So it's smaller, it's easier to manage, there's less pruning, we can reach the fruit more, but the tree's more vulnerable. You might need to stake it, you might need to feed it, you might need to spend more time looking after the tree. So there's a, there's a trade-off between the dwarfing or semi-dwarfing variety, uh, rootstock varieties and the really vigorous, fast-growing ones or the on their own roots, sort of vigorous, wild kinds of trees. So the advantage is that we, why we might graft trees is I can select, these could actually be two different varieties of apples. I could have a red one and a yellow one on, on the same tree if I want it. Uh, suddenly there's a whole new set of possibilities. Um, I might even change what the tree is growing because the market conditions might change. Many, many options as well. Um, and again, there's a lot of detail into the techniques of fruit tree grafting and how we might approach it and what's right at certain times of year. Um, so I've said this before, but permaculture is a study we move from patterns to detail. So before we go into too much detail of the different kinds of grafting techniques, firstly, we're just thinking about why we would do grafting, what would be the advantages, what's the kind of the downside of it. And um, uh, talking to Paul, he'd had, he had uh, propagated his own root stocks for the mango trees, but the scion wood, this bit, the, the, the bit that they're adding, that's going to be the, the yield, the, the fruits, those were quite expensive. Um, he can remind me how much they were, but a dollar or two dollars each or something like that. So, um, so this, yeah, we might get a, a better tree, better fruit, a more controlled growing conditions, but it's going to cost us money. So these are all elements we will have to consider in our design process and what our priorities are in terms of, you know, what are our budgets and what's, is it worthwhile? giving up space to grow a poor tree or this is this is why we use permaculture design try and think these things through so i think another thing which we're going to 
which is going to come around a lot in our discussions about maximizing yields, mm -hmm. uh, about how we use permaculture design. Um, <clears throat> also, the idea about um, how we combine things. So um, I already said that permaculture does, well, <clears throat> excuse me, well, in permaculture, we try to avoid monocultures. Because when we look at nature, we never see a strong domination from a single plant. We notice that plants join together in, and that they can actually act as companions to each other. Um, so the, you might include non-productive plants in your growing areas, because not that you're going to eat them, but they're going to create the right conditions for the plants that you are, you know, for the plants that you value the most. Um, I'm just going to pause for a second. I've got, just check messages inbound. Okay, that looks all right. Uh, I don't know why my phone was ringing. Okay. We want to have a mix of crops. Let's explore patterns, combinations um, that might work together. Let's understand that some plants actually work as companions to others. If you're growing in a harsh environment, you can mix together support species with your crop you'll do much better there's, a, there's loads of detail that where we can study from learn from that let's think about this idea of polyculture poly being many growing not a monoculture the opposite combinations of plants how can we use trees uh perennials um and to support our annuals and our cover crops so let's think about growing in a sequence as well the more water we can bring into our system, the more productive it's going to be. Can we produce fish? Can we do aquaponics? Can we, um, can we have ponds and lakes and containers? Life happens in water. The more water we can have trapped and stored on our site, the more potential for yields there are. Um, let's not forget that there are plants, shrubs, trees that fix nitrogen. Plants that we can grow again, perhaps as fodder for goats and chickens and, and, and something which is also going to continue, continuously help us build our soils. Maybe we could define field edges with nitrogen fixing plants. This is Lucina we've been talking about. It's a plant you can cut and coppice very strongly and it will keep growing back. Can we integrate other elements into our system? Uh, bees, beekeeping, bees are pollinators. The honey is a yield. The bees are very part, much part of every any polyculture food system. Um, we've mentioned bees. Well, maybe we could also carefully integrate poultry. You know, I don't know, chickens, ducks, turkeys. Um, you know, you, you name it. There's, there's always the ability to add elements into the system into our gar growing system so that they're going to contribute to the whole system think about chicken scratch and turn um they, they produce manure they can eat rotten fruit they will control insect larvae um they can cause a lot of damage as well in the garden so just think about how can you use strategies to manage them so that they contribute to the yield because if you've got the chickens or ducks doing work for you and you get the yield of the chickens and the eggs, then you're producing more from your system. Now, remember, Bill Mollison said to us that the, the potential yield of a system is unlimited. Maybe the only limitation is your own imagination about how you might stack things together. So there's a challenge. I don't know what the answer is. Maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong, but he's definitely pushing us to explore in that way whatever you've got whatever you're producing 
you could add something else. You could you could have some honey. You could have some fish. You could get another tree in there. You could, you know, what? how much can you stack into it? We can use vines. We can explore the surfaces of buildings and so forth. Strategies to improve yields. That's what we're thinking about. I also think we're going to have to think, we need to invest time and energy into thinking about people and team building, how we work with other, with how we work with other people, how we motivate people to work together. Can we create a common vision? Can we act and feel like a team? Because really, the resources, the potentials are always around us. We might not always realize it. It might take some time to assemble those and start the process, but for, sh for sure they're there. The challenge really is galvanizing the people, creating a vision and creating the flow so that people feel that they're working together. So strategies to increase yields, we're gonna to need to think about people and team building. We're gonna need more skills in these areas. And I think permaculture brings us, you know, offers a lot, uh, offers a lot to us in these areas. So think about how, you know, permaculture as an ethos, permaculture has these ethics within it. And, and that's very deliberately, because if we can come together and agree about earth care, people care, fair share, uh, understand we're all trying to meet our needs, but we're our own needs, but we're not in competition. If we collaborate through community and we collaborate through an understanding of the natural, natural world, this this is this is the way to bring us together so we can build teams we can come together as groups by offering training um training in permaculture training in the specific skills that sit within permaculture picking compost harvesting water looking after plants looking after animals it's so many 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 different steps to that um we can create tasks that encourage us to work in teams teamwork makes brings people together teamwork creates uh consistency um many hands make like mate make so forget many hands make light work um you know some tasks if you just got to do it by yourself it's just soul destroying and backbreaking if you have a bunch of people to help it can be done in a fraction of the time and and then you can go on and help other people. So um, teamwork, uh, think about savings and loan schemes, groups of, if you're pioneers, farmers, if you're in a refugee settlement, you're in a, in a heart, in, in, you know, there's some people are trying to start their permaculture enterprise often in very challenging circumstances and maybe with very little resource. So how can we work together and pull as a team and what little funds that we do have, can we use them strategically? Can we save them, buy the seeds, the tools, the things that actually go to create yields? We can sell um, and then you know reinvest that money. Just think about that. Um, you know, and the things obviously that we we need is the seeds, the training, the workwear, you know, tools, gloves, uh, boots, all of those things. So yeah. In, 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 in our approaching our design, we're trying to meet the needs of every part of the system. So if we're working with people, we have to think about the needs of those people too, um, the tools they need, the clothing they need, the knowledge they need, and the, the feeling of, 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 of teamship, um, to feel empowered, to work together towards these longer term goals. Um, if we can bring people together, there's nothing that we can't achieve. And um, and I think this is one of the most powerful things that permaculture has to offer. So let us really understand that we need to go down deeper on all of these um, lines of thinking. And as we get deeper into the PDC, we're going to be going deeper down on some of these things. You know, the skills um, with the, the, that we need. 
and, and, and understanding that goes with that. Okay. Um, thinking about how we approach growing plants and food, thinking about um, using permaculture to inform this process, thinking about how we are learning from nature. Okay. Everyone who's growing or farming immediately starts talks about pests and pesticides. And how do we control pests? What can we use to, you know, add and, and within that, it's almost the idea that in growing, we're kind of going to war, that there are goodies and baddies. Now our plants, our yield is the goody, and anything that might be eating it or, you know, coming at it is the baddie. Well, maybe that's not exactly the case. Maybe it's a little bit more complicated than that. And um, in permaculture, I'm going to kind of dare you to think really that, I don't know, not, I know, I'm not going to give any absolutes, but let's let's try and not use the words weed and pest. Or when we do use the word weed and pest, let, let's think about what we mean by that. Because really, a weed is a plant in the wrong place, or it's it, it, it's an unintended consequence. It's not necessarily your enemy. And a pest, again, is it, 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 it might be telling you something. It, it, the presence of that pest might be telling you that your plant isn't healthy. It might be actually giving you information and saying you need to make changes to your system. And rather than seeing the, the pest or the weed and going, ah, I'm going to war, I'm going to, you know, throw poisons at you, or I'm going to, you know, put a lot of energy into getting rid of you, is maybe you haven't created the right conditions for the plants that you're trying to grow. So let's dare to think about that slightly differently. So let's say the first thing is healthy, strong plants don't get attacked by pests. Hey, how about that? It's the weak plants that get attacked. Um, when a plant is healthy and strong, and the, the, the you know the, the 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 density of the sap in the plant um, becomes richer, becomes uh, more nutrient dense, and actually beyond a certain level, most insects can't eat that. They can't digest it. It's poisonous to them. So. how we might approach the health of our garden, how we might approach this idea of, you know, managing pest attack, uh, managing the, the, the vulnerability of our plants is, it's good to know first straight off is, if we've got healthy plants, we've chosen the right seeds, we've created the right growing conditions, then we won't get pests. And we've mixed them together in a nice polyculture, we won't get pests. If, um, it's in a good, moist, open soil, an aerobic soil with moisture and uh, uh, with a healthy soil biota, that plant will be healthy. That plant will be able to resist pest attack. If we think about beneficial plant associations, um, that we can mix plants together we make it much harder for the pests to find their target plant. So here's the thing, insects aren't that clever. They're fairly simple things and they're attracted, if, if, if they're looking for their target plant, attracted usually by the color, smell, the texture, and to agree the shape. Um, they're simple uh, triggers that, that, that are encouraging insects and Again, a really healthy plant, there is nowhere for that insect to latch on. It's going to get killed um, if it tries to eat a really healthy plant. So beneficial plant associations. So if you're growing a plant, which you know is a little bit vulnerable to a certain kind of pest, mix it up with another plant that's a different color. Or use plants that are, have strong colors, like calendula like marigolds, 
uh, nasturtiums we use a lot, um, plants that have a smell like tansy, other herb plants, um, using onions and garlic um, along border edges confuses uh, pests because they, they're strong smelling. Um, allow some of the plants in your garden also, also to go through their full cycle. That allow them to go to seed, allow them to express themselves, to create biomass, because that also creates habitat for the things that predate on the pests. So our simple strategy for integrated pest management is create a really healthy plant, create an environment that's confusing and difficult for potential pests, and then also enhance the conditions that support the predator. Uh, you know, if you've got a lizards or birds regularly visiting your garden, they'll eat a lot of the insects. Um, think about how you use chickens or how you might allow wild other animals to interact with your garden to um, help regulate the potential pest species. It's only a pest because it's been allowed to multiply. In a small number, it's not a pest. It's just part of the ecosystem. When you start using the word pest or weed, something's out of balance. And if you can return that balance, that problematic species will go away. So these are the kind of founding principles behind what we call integrated pest management. All we're doing is copying nature. All we're doing is applying the patterns that we see in nature to our designed systems, gardens, field edges, main crops, Wherever, you know, whatever it is that we're, that we're, that we're designing. So there's a kind of a, a cycle in integrated pest management is observe and interact. You know, inspection, get down on your knees, look underneath the plants, look inside the, you know, the, in, in the crooks, necks and crannies and and the least leaves, learn to look in an inquisitive way. What am I seeing? If there's damage on the leaf, ask yourself why? What was the source of that? So can we, uh, what, let's try and identify what we see. If we can't, if we don't know what the, uh, the cause is or what the problem is, we can describe it. Ask ourselves, do we think that that, what we're seeing, is that insect attack or is that a disease? Is that a nutrient deficiency? We can monitor, we can take notes, we can be conscious of how, 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 how uh, concerned should I be for what I'm seeing? Do I need to take action? What action will I take? Um, I might, there's, there's like a hierarchy of actions in inter integrated pest management. So we'll look at that next, but is, um, and then has the action that I've taken, I squished a few eggs first, here we go, I'm inspecting my plant, I identify, oh look, I've got uh, larvae growing underneath the leaves, um, I'm going to identify what I think those are. My action is I'm just going to squish those eggs with my fingers, and then I'm gonna come back the next day and go, did that work? Was that enough? Are there lots more? Um, is that all I need to do? Maybe I need to do more than that. I'm going to evaluate, and off we go, carry on inspecting carry on asking those very simple questions. But if we're not observing, and the secret with these, um, so think about pest, pest attack. It's telling you something about your garden, your plant, your something, your field, that something's out of balance. Um, you're saying your plants are vulnerable, they could be healthier. And, um, and then what, what interventions can I make that's going to restore the long-term so, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 try and uh, solve that, resolve that problem in the long term. And uh, so it doesn't keep happening. And also in the short term, integrated pest management. So think of that as a constant cycle of observe and interact, learning. Why am I getting this particular thing? Um, what is that telling me about the, the health of the system itself? So we're touching on that. This is really touching on session four, really, when we start thinking about systems, but, um, you know, step by step. 
So there's a hierarchy of um, responses. And let's say the bottom line level of this pyramid, the most important part is Um, prevention. Let's not have any problems at all. Let's do that by having the right plants in healthy soils with the right level of moisture. And we've, we've thought about the balance of nutrients available in the soil. If we could got healthy plant and healthy soil, we shouldn't be having problems. And next level oh, is to stop, stop, um, is, is if, the, if there is a problem is make interventions very early on because these potential pest populations can multiply very quickly so if we find a few eggs early on and squish them we're preventing them from those go those that generation going on and having babies who have babies who have babies um we can weed carefully we can, um, it's, it's, encouraging us to, I was talking about mowing and uh, height of mowing as well, because that's controlling grass, but you know, um, we weed, we observe, we make small interactions. We can have, make small traps. We can make interventions, squishing things and collecting things and picking them off at a certain um, level. Um, when we get on a bigger scale and maybe more um, a, a, a wider pest attack, then we're thinking about encouraging the predators of the of the pest of the target species. Maybe the reason why we have a lot of green fly is because we don't have enough ladybirds, we don't have enough uh, lace wings and hoverflies. Um, if we can then enhance the conditions for predators, encourage them into the garden. Sometimes you can actually um, uh, breed, breed or buy in a uh, predator species, which you can then add and uh, or, or even disease causing organisms. Um, there's a nematode that attacks the slug. You, you, can, uh, you can buy a preparation with that and water that into your garden. But really the question you should be asking is, is if you're having a slug attack or snail attack or a mite attack, is why is that happening? And ultimately the answer to resolve that comes from the lower levels of, of this pyramid is we need to create the right conditions for the plant. So it's not stressed, then we won't have a problem. Now, the fourth level and the ultimate, you know, thing to, to the last thing, the most extreme thing that we might do would be to come in with a pesticide. Now, I would always um, think very carefully about that. We can create organic pesticides. We can create biodegradable, non-toxic pesticides out of natural ingredients. So, and a lot of those work by choking the airwaves of the pest insects. So sprays with, you know, sticky, flowery type material, making like a glue um things which um are, are caustic or burn to the insects and um this is a set of strategies around that but i'd stress you know multiple times really one is we don't want to use anything any kind of pesticide that's going to affect the soil microbes because that's going to affect the long-term fertility of your of your soil and then that's going to actually erode the base of your ipm triangle it's more important to concentrate on the health of the soil than by attacking the things that are actually telling you that your soil isn't healthy. You're not solving the problem by killing the pest. You're actually shooting the messenger. It's a very, very important lesson. Um, so using pesticides would be a single application, one time only, um, non-toxic, to save a situation that then is then going to inform you that you know, save your crop to then inform you perhaps to move on, you know, to, to work at lower levels of this pyramid, spend more time thinking about your soil, soil quality, your compost, uh, and all of the other elements of your system.
um, integrated pest management. This is permaculture is trying to give us patterns to help us order our thoughts in a sort of strategic and priority way. Um, this is a, uh, a quote from Ali Raza. Soil, a nation that destroys its soil, destroys itself. It's a very big statement. If the only new energy coming in is coming from the sun, and only plants can translate that energy into storable, digestible food, and plants grow in soil, we need soil. Soil's the most important thing. Soil's that magic place where dead stuff becomes alive stuff again. So we have to very much within our strategies to increase yields is, hey, we're super interested in soil. We're really um, interested in maintaining the quality of our soil. So, we've already touched on soil in an earlier lecture, and in that soil, we, in that uh, lecture, we talked about soil food web. Now, I want to go deeper on that now. And um, this is going to be the beginning of our understanding of how we get rid of pests. This is the beginning of our understanding of how we make a soil that can catch and store enormous amounts of water and have vast root systems that can access that water. We can make your, your growing systems much more drought proof by teaming up with the soil food web. So this is the beginning now of thinking a bit more deeply about how we create the optimum conditions to grow plants. Plants that translate the energy of the sun into the materials that we need for our clothes, for our shelter, for our energy, and for our food. This is very, very important. And again, permaculture patterns to detail. We keep coming around. I want you to see the patterns. By now, you should be recognizing these patterns. We're going to be adding layer on layer on layer of detail. Because when we talk about soil science, there's no bottom. There's no, there's no, you know, it just gets more and more fantastical. It gets more and more complex. Um, it's, it's, it's a wild, it's a wild ride as a subject. Let's not get far ahead of ourselves. Um, quick revision. Trophic levels, trophic relating to energy, energy translation. So the energy coming in is from the sun. And that is translated by plants into organic matter. So in terms of biomass in any system, there's going to be the most organic, most biomass is going to be at the first trophic level. Because as things eat that biomass and turn it into uh, fungi, uh, nematodes and bacteria, um, some of that energy is going to be lost. So that because there's obviously organisms respire and they that energy dissipates. So the biomass in, a, in an ecosystem is always going to be um, sort of pyramidal in structure. And that's an important way of thinking about our um, the trophic layers within soil. And there's five. And to have healthy soil that's totally resistant to pest attack, you need all five. There's no um, mixing match here. We have to build the whole ecosystem. Um, and <clears throat> let's just remind us what they look like. There are root feeding nematodes. They're little worms. They're not really the good guys. They, they um, are taking energy away um, from plants, but they also might be eaten by micro arthropods, uh, little insects, and those nutrients then become available to the system again. Um, there are enormous quantities of bacteria and fungi that build associations with the roots. So a teaspoon in soil might have thousands of different types of bacteria in it. It might have several miles of fungi in it. And as those organisms 
live and die. They're living off the sugars and exudates coming off the roots of the plants. They're often returning, they're maybe decomposing. Um, they have a, a relationship with the plants where their nutrients are constantly, energies coming from the, from the, the plants to these organisms and organisms are making plant available nutrients returning back to the plant. So as we move up this trophic pyramid, as we get through into the soil food web, uh, we realize that there are protozoa, nematodes, arthropods that predate on the fungi and bacteria. Fungal and bacterial feeding nematodes. Um, little insects that break up and shred organic matter um, that then is digested by fungi bacteria and return back to plants again. Um, the more of these individual organisms that we have, and the greater numbers of them that we have, um, the healthier soil is. So in our strategies to increase our yields, we're gonna be teaming up with the soil food web. We're going to be becoming more familiar with the idea of bacteria, fungi, nematodes, microarthropods, protozoa, and a larger uh, worms, nematodes, arthropods, and, and the birds and mammals that feed on them. It's these are the nutrients of your soil, and these make the nutrients bioavailable to your plants. Okay, um, I want to just bring you into, well, I'm going to name check a couple of things now. Okay, sorry. Um, this is something that, that I've been reading more about recently and beginning to understand, which is something I hadn't fully understood, is the minerals that you need to grow your plants are in your soil. They're in the clay, silts, sands, pebbles, and rocks. Everything you need is there. The raw materials are there. I don't care what type of soil you've got. The, nutri the, the potential minerals that plant and seed are there. But the thing is, they're not bioavailable. Plants can't access them. As you build your soil food web, as the the life, the biota in the soil um, lives and dies, those nutrients then start to cycle and they start to become available. And the more available they are, the healthier your plants are. And what's interesting is your plants become more nutritious. And by nutritious, I mean, they contain more sugar, more vitamins, and more minerals and we can think about the nutrient density of the sap of a plant so you think if a plant is really healthy because it's supported by all of this life in the soil then the nutrients the juice in these leaves are going to be higher quality how do we know well one way to know is taste actually the the the, the stronger the taste the nicer the better tasting uh, the plant the vegetable you might be familiar with um, that's giving a clue that it's going to have more nutrients in it, in its, in its leaves. So this little tool here, this eye, um, it's a light, it's, a, it's, um, it's called a refractometer. Um, it's a little tool. I have showed some of my students it. And um, yeah, it's, it's a very simple tool that you squeeze your plant and you need to extract the sap. Not the mush, not the fibres of the plant, but the sap, the, the liquid. And you put a drop of it on this uh, slide and close the lid and then you hold it to the light. And when you look down it, you can see a scale. This is what this uh, other image is of. And on that scale, there'll be a line and you can read that value. And that value is telling you 
the bricks value of the sap of that plant. And what that means is, it's telling you how much dissolved sugar there is in it. And the higher that bricks value, the denser, the more syrupy the sap of the plant is. And that's telling you that that plant is really healthy and, and that it's nutrient dense. And therefore, the healthier the plant, the more certain we are that we have the correct soil biology in place, because that's the only way that plant is going to have a high bricks value. It's called a, 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 a BRIX uh, refractometer. And with a brick scale, it's telling us the, how syrupy the, the sap of the plant is. So we'll talk about this a bit more in detail later on, but once it gets above eight, nine, 10, 11, 12%, sugars in the sap then the aphids and stem boring plant uh, insects can't access anymore it kills them and, and as it rises then it becomes resistant to more and more different types of potential pest attack so very very interesting and something that we will go into a bit later on we've been doing some research into this over the last couple of years and something which i want to show you uh, share with you but really what we're understanding is to be six, to have a, 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 a resilient, productive growing system, we need to build a relationship with the whole of this soil food web. Um, I'm going to name check Dr. Elaine Ingram and her and her team She's a soil scientist. She's been studying soils for like three decades. And it's really, when I was at school, when I was at college, when I was at university, we used to say, professors and teachers would say, oh, the, the soil is so, what's going on in that top inch or two of soil is so complex, we don't understand it. And for a long time, that's very true. And to a certain extent, we don't need to know the name of all these insects. We don't need to actually understand every, identify every bacteria. What we need to do is to understand the pattern. We need to understand the conditions that soil life needs so that it can get on with the job it needs to do. But it's Dr. Elaine Ingram who, and her team who have really unpacked soil biology, who have really begun to understand what is going on and to use microscopes and tools to identify and name these elements, understanding different forms of bacteria, fungi, nematodes, protozoa, uh, microarthropods, and everything else in the system, how they contribute and how, um, yeah, who are the goodies and who are the baddies, or what conditions, what processes do we need to create the right condition so that we have the soil goodies, the beneficial ones, the things we want to promote the ones that we want, and we want to suppress the ones that are damaging. So here's, here's so you can join in on Dr. Elaine Ingram's Soil Food Web. There are lectures and you can do a whole program and, and uh, pay for, but there's lots of free content on YouTube. And, I, and uh, I've summarized uh, some of her work on a, on a blog post on the Sector 39 website as well. But let's just, I'll give you a few of her pearls of wisdom. There is no soil on this planet that does not contain the nutrients to grow your plants. What we have done, the failing, the reason why your plants aren't growing is because we've killed the soil biology. If you kill the soil biology, then you have to do the work that, that, that they were doing. So if you haven't got the worms and the microbes and the bacteria and fungi in your soil that moves, maintains that soil, then you've got to do it. You've got to buy additives and add them. You've got to add the water. You've got to make the compost. It's hard work. So if we understand this complex web of life in the soil, if we can work with that and promote them, create the right conditions for them, so that we get the right kinds of soil organisms, then our plants are healthy and, and the, the soil is healthy and the nutrients are continuously available. We do not need to buy fertilizers and we do not need to buy pesticides. We need to rebuild the soil. 
and in rebuilding the soil and identifying that that's one of our key roles and objectives in permaculture, then that helps us understand that we are a team, that we're doing this together. That the whole work, the, the way we solve this big, scary, huge climate problem is everybody needs to go home and build soil, starting right from their back garden, right from their back back door of their house. And, you know, closer to home, we pay more attention, we get more feedback, we get more motivation. We need to start building, catching and storing energy and building systems um, together and understand that that's that as a global endeavor will make a very significant change um whilst you know looking after us so you can make compost out of anything all waste materials well all organically sourced waste materials something that has lived and uh, uh, you know can, will can compost. All organic matter in the right conditions will break down into compost. It's a kind of a universal truth. So we can think about farm wastes. Think about house wastes. Think about where they've come from, um, and 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 whether they're hazardous or not. You know, we might need different plans and strategies to deal with these things, but they all are potentially useful to us. It is even, um, and we talk about, uh, you know, manures and the farm waste, but there's also human manure, human manure. Um, again, we have to be careful. There might be pathogens, could be disease causing organisms, uh, parasites. But at the end of the day, it's the same nutrients and materials that the soil is made out of and the plants are cycling. So it's about, handling and using things appropriately our weeds can go into our compost but we might be aware that those weeds might be carrying seeds we might be promoting accidentally promoting plants that otherwise we might regard to be pests but again if we handle those in the right way they're part of the yield of the system and they can be returned and composted and reincorporated um think about all those dry grasses how much of that that might get burned off every year. Think about the value, potential value of, the, of that carbon, the straw and the stems that could be used for composting. Think about how we can use those mulches or incorporate them into systems that are going to help build soil carbon. Dr. Elaine Ingrams tells us that to have really healthy soil, you need to get it up to about 3% organic matter. And the way to do that is to add carbon, add compost, use mulch. In a small and localized area, that's fine. We can do that. If we're doing it on a larger area, we might need to think again. We might need different strategies because we can't making tons and tons of compost and then carrying it and distributing it, that becomes very challenging. But again, one of our key ideas in permaculture is we start small, we learn the lesson, and then as we scale up, we, you know, we want to make, make mistakes at a small scale. A small scale, a small scale mistake is a learning opportunity. A large scale mistake is a disaster. So Think about all waste materials and the source of where it comes from and a strategy in which we might be able to collect it and channel it and usefully use it in a compost system. There's two broad types of your waste and this, and typically we might well, it's not always exclusively true, but um, let's talk about greens and browns. There's, I think, um, the things that have more nitrogen in them tend to be the greens. So by that may mean fresh green leaves and grasses and food waste and um, actually manures are very high in um, in nitrogen. So the greens tend to be high in nitrogen. And this is energy. This is the fuel because in your compost heap, 
you're trying to create the perfect uh, conditions for a microbe party. You want them to re reproduce, replicate, breed, and uh, yeah, promote themselves. So question. Okay, why do we make compost? Instead of just going on about compost and how important it is, even why? Well, we're making compost because we want to rebuild the biology. We want to energize the biology in the soil. The minerals you need are there. You don't need fertilizer. What you need is microbes. You need the right microbes to make those nutrients cycle and become bioavailable, become pl available to plants. Um, it's no good if they're just locked up in the soil, they have to be made available to the plants. And it's the it's life in the soil that does that. That's the life in the soil that's, that, that makes that happen. So our first strategy for promoting the life in the soil is to create the ideal conditions for it. And we do that with compost. And in a compost heap, we're bringing together greens and browns. We're bringing together sources of nitrogen and sources of carbon. Um, the carbon is food for the fungi. The nitrogen is energy for the microbes. The microbes are going to have a party and the fungi are going to have a party. And the whole lot is going to digest that organic matter and feed all of those soil microbes, boost their population, and then make those nutrients bioavailable, plant available nutrients. This is how we do it. And then that instantly, well, increases the carbon content of your soil, which you want to get to 3% um, for long-term fertility. So according to Elaine Ingrams, the greens are about 30 to one carbon to nitrogen. Everything's got a lot of carbon in it because that's what organic matter is made out of. Um, the browns might be 50 to 1. Um, we bring compost heaps together in layers. Brown, green, brown, green, brown, green. Um, we think about creating the right humidity. It needs to be moist, not wet. It needs to, it needs to be aerobic. Um, so let's, let's just quickly, I want to just come back to the slide, just to jump, to jump forward to the slide is, the organisms that we want to promote, the good guys, those four or five layers of, of trophic, uh, uh, layers of our trophic pyramid, they're all aerobic. Even those bacteria and fungi at the beginning of the system, just like you and me, if they respire and interact, they produce heat, they breathe in oxygen and they breathe out carbon dioxide. If you create a low oxygen environment, you're starting to promote the bad guys, the, poi the, 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 the disease bearing organisms, pathogens, the wrong kind of feeders things that are going to attack your plant um, and we keep our compost heap aerobic by not compacting it by it not being saturated with water by having a lot of carbon the carbon provides if you like think of it creates the structure of the heap um, if you just have too much wet stuff too much green if you just had a pile of old fruit or something like that it goes anaerobic. If it's smelly, your compost should smell sweet. If it smells sour, vinegary, um, stinky, like rotten eggs, you've not done it right. It must not smell. You want it to be aerobic. Um, so, um, and in aerobic conditions, we promote the beneficial organisms. So, Our approach to making a compost heap might be that our consideration is um, 
let's be aware of what's gone in it. If, do we, if we have human manure in there, if we have weed seeds in there, is that's going to contain pathogens. That's going to contain uh, seeds which you know, might be promoting the, the otherwise species you consider as weeds. So bearing in mind the material that we're composting, bearing in mind the source of that material and what's in it, um, we might want to create a hot compost heap. And a hot compost heap has certain advantages um, because it kills the pathogens. So here's really interesting is, as the temperature rises, the first things to die are the disease-causing organisms. Listeria, uh, um, Salmonella, E. coli, uh, disease-causing organisms are killed by the heat in the compost heap. And if you um, get your balance of greens and browns right and your moisture and your uh, oxygen, the heat, the heat will quickly rise to 70 degrees centigrade in the middle, in the, where the conditions are optimum, the temperature will rise really quickly. And 70 degrees centigrade, I'll tell you how hot that is, as when you put your hand into the heat, you can't keep it in. It's just too hot to keep in. Okay, it's 70, that's that's hot. And um, what will happen is when you first rate, uh, greens, browns, greens, browns, greens, browns, maybe a bit of soil on top, moisture. Um, if you get in that right, the center of your heat will get really hot. It will climb up in temperature and then it will drop down again. And that's when you want to turn your heap. And when we say turn it, we don't really mean upside down, we mean inside out. We want to, you want to peel off the outer layers and put them into the middle, make a new heap, and then what was in the middle goes on top. If you do that a few times, each time you do it, the temperature will rise again and fall again. And if you've reached 70 degrees centigrade for 48 hours, it's you know, over perhaps a few days, but a total, you can be clear, you can be confident that you've killed any pathogens in that heap and that what remains is useful is, is is what you want so in within a compost heap we raise the temperature we create the right conditions for the uh, thermophilic bacteria the bacteria do a lot of breaking down and then that will kill many of the pathogens and seeds um, as the temperature then as the heat cools down other organisms will move in and you'll see uh, worms, compost worms appearing and other, other organisms. And they also, as they digest the compost material, they kill the pathogens. So we've got heat treating and then we've got worm treating. Um, the worms aren't going to kill your weed seeds, but they're going to otherwise create a good, clean compost. We understand source of our materials, create the right conditions, uh, and then we can be confident that we're removing potentially disease-causing organisms, and 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 the, the, the yeah potentially a, a, a problematic seeds. So, problem organisms favour a low oxygen environment, so, and, and seeds killed by heat. So by being so we can create an aerobic heat, it will get hot. We can favor the beneficials and we can kill off the, the problems. So um, Dr. Elaine has, has, has really taken this quite deep. And I'm gonna go a little bit into this. Um, and one of the reasons I'm gonna go in, well, I think this is hugely important. And I think I've, I feel I'm really learning something by paying attention to her work. This is very contemporary. And, and I think I can share this with you. And also is these are experiments that we're going to be doing in our own garden at Trevlak Farm in later weeks of this course. So we're not just, um, you, you'll have a chance to do this yourself and you get a chance to see what us going through these processes. So Dr. Ingram says, uh, Elaine Ingram says, look, if, if your garden is small or in a, let's say 100 meters, whatever, you can make your compost, you can put it in your wheelbarrow, you can put it on the garden. There we go. 
And if you put two inches, which is what's that about um, six centimeters a year, that's enough to be able to have your beds be continually fertile. But what happens if you've got a 10 acres of garden or I don't know, a much bigger area to cover? And what happens if you, um, you know, you don't, you haven't got the physical strength or the material to make tons and tons of compost. What can you do then? Is there another way? And Elaine Ingram says, yes. The other way is to make compost tea. So here's, here's now where I invite you onto a journey where we begin to think about something. It's new for me, but I will, we will be testing in coming weeks and I'm excited about this. Um, so here we go is if we've got a small garden and we've got lots of organic material, we can make compost, we can turn that compost, we can add that as a top dressing to our beds, we continuously feed our garden with this compost, that's great. But once we get to a certain size and we want to uh, address you know, bigger areas, um, then perhaps we need other strategies. And the other strategy is, is to make a compost tea. So we're gonna talk about that for a little bit and then I'm going to jump out of this and we're going to look at some examples from uh, other projects. Um, okay, so, so. This is a process. This is again, this is helping us think about this. So, um, what we're actually going to do is we're going to breed the microbes that we want, the beneficial soil microbes, by creating a really good compost heap. It doesn't have to be huge. But what we want to do is to create the right conditions and usually to get to get a good fermentation get a good reaction your compost heap needs to be a minimum of a meter cubed or maybe 120 wide and 80 tall or something like that but approximately a meter cube um and we want to have it biodegrading you just at the ambient temperature we're not we're not, not trying to heat it or cool it we want to have the same conditions as where um we will be using it and we want to make sure we've got a, a really aerobic heap so we're going to do that by careful layering and using lots of carbon um to make our compost tea we are going to make it in water. So this is this is the thing is we've got a different strategy here. We, we can biodegrade lots of organic matter to create the compost organisms and the compost. But if we want to make more, we want to spread it over a much wider area. Actually, what we need to do is to promote the compost organisms. Can we breed and multiply the compost organisms and then add them to our soil this is the clever stuff so and to do that we can well let's make a tea you make a tea in water so our water quality needs to be good it needs to have the right ph it needs to be in a, a sort of ambient temperature um there needs to be energy in that water for the microbes to extract um, oh, I'll unpack this. There's quite a lot to think about this here. So uh, I've just been writing this lecture today. So I'm a little bit of fine tuning. So the first thing that we are encouraged to do, so the process of making a compost tea, step one, we make good compost heap and at least a meter cubed. And we're going to turn it a few times. It's going to go hot. It's going to cool down. We're going to watch all the worms and the um visible parts of the soil biota to move into that compost heap it's going to smell nice it's going to be crumbly and open and it's not going to be sour or vinegary we've made a really nice quality aerobic nice smelling compost okay 
Um, so we're now going to make a compost tea. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to we're going to need a barrel which we're going to make our tea in or a container some kind and we're going to fill it with water but the water that we put in that barrel needs to be beneficial for the microbes so we don't want chlorinated water now if you have mains tap water here in the uk it's got chlorine in it in fact um it's got other chemicals in it as well all of which are added to kill life we don't want loads of microbes in our water pipes um so if our water has um it has chlorine and chloramine okay so chlorine will evaporate off as a gas but chloramine doesn't it's in the water um and uh, there might be other can other problems with that um with, with your water potentially so all of that is resolved though by adding humic acid and we are told by dr ingram that if you take some of your compost and put it in a cloth and you run some water through it gently when that water comes out it's going to be brown and that brown color tinge in the water that's the humic acid and that contains it doesn't contain lots of soil microbes but it contains um compounds which will help rectify the water that you're going to use so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to wash some of your compost through um in, in, in some kind of a sieve or, 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 or cloth, wash out some of that humic acid, and you're going to add that to your water, and that will neutralize the chlorine or any other added chemicals. Um, it will make sure that the conditions for the right fermentation are there in your, in the water barrel. So this is how we make a compost tea. We get the water, we, you'll see us do this, so don't worry about all of the details. I'm trying to walk you through the process. You understand, we're promoting, we're multiplying out those soil microbes. So rather than making tons of compost, we're going to make a tea that promotes at least the first three layers of that trophic pyramid. Because those organisms have a, quite a short life cycle. So if we create the right conditions, they will multiply very quickly. So we're going to add, we're going to wash humic acid off of the compost and add that to the um, to the barrel. And it's going to, so that there's a slight brown tint to the water. Then we know that we've got enough. It doesn't need to be dark, but just a slight brown tinge to the water from this humic acid. Now we've created the right conditions to promote soil microbes. So the water quality is critical pH, salts, temperature, and the energy to extract the organisms. All oh, right, yeah, we're going to come to that. Um, we're worried about whether the chlorine or chloramine was in that water. Okay, so we're now going to, we've created the water with the humic acid. To make our aerated compost tea, we now need to go back to our compost. Compost that we've made, and it's good quality. Oh, look, here's a... Here's a chemical formula for humic acid. Look at this wonderfully complicated molecule of basically carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, a whole bunch of different things bound together. Um, these, this is a building block of healthy soil systems. Uh, you can buy it, you can buy pre preparations of it, but you can produce it yourself by making good compost. Um, Okay, this is how Dr. Ingrams explains it. Now, when we talked about soil and soil formation, I talked about the crumb structure of soil. So, and we also talked about the soil particles. Remember clay, silt, sand, gravels, rocks that soils are made out of. And the clay, silt, sand, that's the size of the particle. So clays are really, really small. In fact, about the size of bacteria. Um, 
And but as these soil particles are interacted with by the the uh, soil biota, they become glued together into crumbs. So think about this. Imagine that you were try and empathise. Imagine you're a little bacteria. Imagine you're a little colony of bacteria, and when it rains, you're going to get washed away. So as these bacteria live and die, what they do is they exude a glue and they stick themselves to the soil particles. They aggregate the soil particles together and create a crumb and a crumb structure, which protects them, creates the right conditions. And, um, and prevents them from being washed away. So this is a key thing that she really stressed was um, to um, release the, these microbes into the water of your compost tea. You need more than just washing a bit of water through like you did to extract the humic acid. Um, to make our compost tea, we need it to be an aerobic atmosphere. So you're going to need some kind of a pump and you're going to need to bubble water through the through the um uh, through the barrel now this might be out of reach for you but you might begin to think creatively about how you might solve that problem is it so, you've got to be able to bubble water continuously through your system for 24 hours or 48 hours depending on the temperature if it's warmer it happens more quickly life happens more quickly um uh so this this might be the challenge might be the limiting factor but all we need is a small pump that will can then push air um to the bottom of the tank and that bubble up so Factors that make a good compost tea. Number one, well, we need good compost that was aerobic and it is full of the organisms and the nutrient for the organisms. Um, the next most important thing is that the tank is fully aerated. So actually what we're going to do is make like a tea bag. Imagine you had your muslin cloth um, or, 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 or old shirt or something that we make a, we make a bag of the compost and we suspend that in the tank with the water bubbler with the air being pushed in from a little pump that comes out through a rose we have bubbled air and that bubble air is going to interact with that compost continuously and as the air bubbles up through it it's going to dislodge the bacteria the fungi the nematodes the protozoa that are stuck together with that glue and so that they become free and can circulate within the tank mm. Sorry, receiving a phone call. I wonder what that is. Just one second, sorry. I just need to. Talk among yourselves for a moment. Sorry about this. Um, family responsibilities. Steve? Yes. We could take a minute. Yeah, it's, it's time break. for a little break, isn't it? Yes, thank yeah, you. Let's take a break and then we can be back at uh, 20 past for the next session because yeah. now it's 7 past. Okay, thank you, Gerald. All right. Yeah. Okay, guys, see okay. you in uh, 12 minutes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is back. Thank you. You can do a thumbs up if you're on. Uh, Steve? Yes. Uh, Simon had a question, a very important question. 
Okay. He wanted to know what exactly is a pest. It's a good question. There's no such thing. Well, I didn't say that exactly, but we've come to regard things as pests because they're competing with us for our resources, eating our crops. Um, you know, stem borers and army worms and aphids and you know, there's things that attack, attack our crops. What, what I'm saying though, is that actually they only attack the weak crops. They attack unhealthy plants are vulnerable to pest attack. And if we have healthy plants, we shouldn't have pests. We shouldn't have those organisms that feel like they're our enemy. We want to kill them. Would anyone else like to add to that? Oh, thanks, Steve. Yeah, usually what I tell uh, people is, first of all, in an ecosystem environment, a pest is simply a very important element, probably in a long place or in the wrong placement, like at the wrong time. Sometimes I tell people, even us ourselves, if we are wrongly placed and we haven't done proper planning, we will end up uh, probably getting regarded as pests. So the reality is there is nothing like a permanently destructive element. It's a case of either placement or wrong planning. And I think as we go on, we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing more and more of this. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Um, okay, so we were talking about compost teas. And we're going to be making compost teas. We're going to be showing you our process. So I'm going to stop on that. I felt like I was getting into a lot of detail. And at this stage of the course, I want to still be thinking about these wider patterns. And what we've been thinking a lot about is strategies to maximize yields by observing nature, understanding the, the organisms, the conditions they need, but also thinking about how we as people, as much as we're thinking about the biology and the soil, we're also thinking about our communities and society, how we work together. Matt? Uh, Tracy, where is that? You're okay? Yeah. Um, so this is a little bit, it's going off on a, on a, on a, on a following a slightly different line of thinking, but um, this is a talk, grow your own neighborhood. Let's just think about strategies that we might do to build communities and links between people. And a few years ago, I, I did some work with an organization called Squash Nutrition. They're based in Liverpool. Liverpool's a big city. Um, it used to be one of the most powerful and rich and important cities in the world in about 1860. And more recently, it's had quite hard times. There's quite a lot of poverty there and need to for, for sort of social re regeneration. Um, and I'm going to just sort of touch on a few stories around this, around on that theme. And this was a talk that, that was done for them. Um, I'll just let some people still arriving. Okay. Um, squash Nutrition, or an arts and health, health initiative, art and health, um, they had an idea to, as a social enterprise um, to engage with the community and on and they brought together people who were nutritionalists, gardeners, cooks, artists, beekeepers, workers, writers. Think about this in Nachivali or in, um, you know, in, in a community setting. Think about perhaps bringing together a range of skills that could help participate in creating accessible, creative, interactive ways to bring people into thinking about improving their well-being. So permaculture is about how we meet our needs, it's about well-being, well-being in the in natural world, in our community and in, in ourselves. So let's think about how we might do that. So Squash have done all sorts of work over the years, public health events, outreach events, telling people about the 
positive benefits of, you know, of good nutrition, of exercise, of being sociable, um, uh, tackling long-term health issues and health, well-being issues. Um, they squashed all of it, ways to engage with the people. They thought growing food, cooking food, everybody likes to eat food. So if we can just build people's interest into it. So a real problem in the West is people eat processed food, too much processed food, and it's kind of cheap, but it's bad for you. So they squash are interested in engaging people with growing food, but eating and preparing food, and also in bees and beekeeping, and using art and different kinds of activities to energize the community. Uh, Refine how to find, have fun and engage with people, get people out and operating together. They created lots of resources to help achieve that and um, including urban food projects. They had a film festival. So think about, look, what I love about this organization is that they've used so many different approaches to engage and connect with people. Um, yeah, from having films to arts, drawing, making, cooking, sharing. You know, some people are interested, want to know about beekeeping. Some people want to know about fruit trees. Um, can we use art and communication skills to join people together? Uh, this is a cinema in a polytunnel. Um, this is a, a garden in the back of a truck. <laughs> um, this is like making use of community spaces, uh, available community spaces to have fun and bring people together. What can we achieve by being creative? The part of the project that I was engaged in was one they called Village Farm Orchard. And the idea was we were going to start small forest gardens, little food forests, polyculture systems that might live for several years or many years in and amongst people's houses to grow them on land that was maybe publicly owned, public spaces, not private spaces. If a tree, fruit trees growing on a land that no one owns, who owns the fruit? Whoever picks it. Um, we're interested in creating assets that made the community come together and feel like that they had shared wealth, if you like. Hi there. Um, I just, yeah. Hi, I'm just I'm in a Zoom call, so I shall carry on. Yeah, so um, I had um, a very interesting couple of years working with community groups. Here's a map of, the, of the, what they call Stockbridge Village, high density social housing project in an urban setting but actually with lots of green spaces on the edges and, um, you know, traffic circles and actually spaces which I often see are cultivated in Uganda. But in the UK, very much not. It's quite a radical idea to do that. The project tried to use art and uh, uh, observations from the community to help them see and value what they had around them. Um, and, you know, we always want to, there's the danger tendency is to always wish that we had something from outside or something from far away to meet our needs rather than realizing permaculture is well can we generate that locally from what we have already and to be able to do that we need to value what we have what, what's there um so to grow your own community you need to buy local you need to interact with people locally um, I love the image of this hand that becomes a tree with, with subdivisions that might connect people together. So let's think about how we might use permaculture to connect people together. How do we make our community stronger? How do we make people feel that they're part of a team? How do we make people feel they're part of a collective effort, a long term effort towards achieving these goals of catching and storing energy and building yields? which then nourish the community. This is, this is what we're trying to do as, as, as um, permaculture designers. So this next picture is of a monoculture. This is a field. And what you're seeing there is plastic film, which is being put on the soil to protect it um, from, it's to make it a bit warmer and, 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 and a little bit less wet. 
so that we can have successional plantings of the same plant. This is a 300 acre field. It's growing one type of vegetable, two varieties of one type of vegetable. It's a true monoculture. The only way you can maintain monocultures is by using lots of pesticides and lots of fertilizers because you're creating the right conditions for pests and you're depleting your soil because you're returning nothing back. This is the absolute op opposite of permaculture. We, we, this is what we're trying to steer you away from. Don't do this. Don't try and just have a huge area of one plant. It's going to come into all sorts of trouble very quickly. I like this little graphic. It said, try organic food, or as our grandparents called it, food. Um, we make this big song and dance in the modern day about organic food and food quality. Um, and I've already told you that good quality food comes from good quality soil. Well, before we damaged our soils, before we killed the life in our soils, all of our food was organic and all of our food was healthy. A lot of what you have there in Africa is still organic and good quality food. But the more you damage the soils, the more you till and plow and use um, pesticides and fertilizers, you will deplete the soil biota and you'll be there send, spending a premium to get food that's actually nutritious. Um, community gardens. I like community gardens. I like these spaces that bring us together and in a sort of common um, uh, endeavor. This is in New York City, this is on Manhattan Island. Um, uh, in, in previous decades, communities have, have been very proactive about rehabilitating derelict sites within the city where houses had fall down or you know, uh, um, bare bits of land that were, that were just maybe spoiled urban spaces were carefully cultivated to make into community gardens, spaces where people can come together to grow food and also to recreate and interact with each other. From there, before we can build community, we can have stronger links between people and the potentials to create so much more and achieve so much more by building teams. So here, very simple, food waste composting. Compost strategy is at the heart of the garden. Uh, waste cycling is at the heart of community. And from this, catching and storing energy, returning to the soil, we can build yields. This is how we do it. This is what it looks like in New York City. Um, what does it look like in your place? So in a big city like this, just how valuable are these green spaces to birds and insects, to wildlife, to people, air quality? Think about the multiple yields from such a space, the community bonding, the community interaction. All of this, what can come from a community garden, aside from the food, aside from the soil building. Um, as I say, if they, if this is how, if they're doing it in New York City, understand how you take the same ideas and translate them to suit your climate, your needs, and using the resources that you have. This is another one in, whereas this is Long Island City in the neighborhood of Queens. So this is also greater New York City. And what you're looking at there is an intensive vegetable growing operation on the roof of a building that is one, two, three, four, five, six floors up. Now roofs can be problematic. They're windy. You haven't got much soil depth. Um, you've got to think about where your water's coming from. Um, but look at this for creative use of available spaces. Um, look how we have a polyculture garden, lots and lots of variation, different conditions, um, creating lots of niches for different people as well. Think how many jobs this kind of farm creates. Just a couple of guys sitting on big machines driving up and down. It doesn't create community, it destroys community. Um, this kind of garden 
builds community, it builds soil, it recycles waste, it, 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 it starts to become part of the sort of cultural ecosystem. This is what we want to do. This is good design. Um, this is an abandoned elevated railway that's become a walkway. And then again, the edges of it have been allowed to regenerate and to cultivate, to become either productive for nature, productive for people, um, creating a quality space for people. Look how in permaculture, we're very good at utilizing otherwise unused edges, surfaces, roofs, old roadways. Think about that idea about succession that we kept talking about is that we can creep in and spot these opportunities. What can we do? Can we engineer circumstances that bring people together in ways in which we create more social cohesion and we create almost inviting people into a common vision? We can use community gardens. And community gardens can look like anything. They just need to fulfill the function and you use what isn't being used. This is 2009. Here's a group of people, they're actually on a permaculture course. We've identified an underused piece of ground and we are designing and planting a food forest on it. Um, we've been studying that as part of our course. Um, we generated a budget because we've had some course fees for people on, on that course. And with that, we bought plants and there's our garden that we've planted. There it is uh, 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 some months later uh, becoming established. Fruiting trees, shrubs, ground layer herbs, working together as a whole to create a system that looks after itself, feeds every component within the system, and as it grows and develops, creates yields for us for people, the fruits and herbs and berries and, 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 and everything else that come from it. This is another rooftop. This is a community center in Reading. This is actually, this building here on the left is um, 39 London Street, Reading. And the reason why the training organization, we're called Sector 39 or S39, is because a part of my permaculture education and part of my growing up was to be involved in the conceiving and establishing of this roof garden, turning this a leaky, ugly rooftop in a city centre into something that has 170 species of plants, all of which are edible, medicinal, herbal, multiple use. And this whole system is organic and it runs on its own, the nutrients that it cycles within it. This meets all of our permaculture criteria. And, and at the same time, it creates a, a, an environment for people. This is an education center. So actually what you're looking at is a classroom. It's a place where people can come together, talk and learn, interact with each other, but it's shaded and you know, the conditions are created, are modified by the presence of those plants. So think how permaculture landscapes can, can fulfill many functions. This is feeding insects. This is feeding birds. This is building soil. And this is feeding people, but it's also a place of recreation, of interaction, of learning, um, a complex environment that's built out of the locally available resources that have been combined together strategically to create something that has a life of its own. This is permaculture. Come Harry. This picture here is um, actually an organization in, in, in um, this is um, 2010, um, that had a factory that made compost from organic waste from the town of Newtown, and actually, it, which is the town of Wales and neighboring towns. So what you're looking at here, let's just go back a bit, is this big shed here is a big factory. And if we go inside that shed, this is what it looks like. Oh, there we can see it from behind as well, like a big just industrial building, pretty ugly. And there's a, a dead piece of ground behind it. 
what they're doing in that building is they're joining together carbon and nitrogen in a way which will create a usable pathogen free seed free compost this is how they do it this pile of waste here of of, of, of material here is actually food waste each one of those is in it's in a biodegradable bag a, a bag made out of cellulose and in there is high nitrogen food waste vegetable peels cooked food animal bones you name it all that stuff and what's going to happen to it is they're also going to bring all of the branches and trees have been cut from overhanging power lines and road edges we're not going to burn that we don't want to return that carbon to the atmosphere uh, really quickly what we want to do is use that carbon to make compost we get carbon and nitrogen balance right then we get a really good compost so that's what happens here is this green machine here it's called it says eco green on it it's a macerator I, th I think there's a conveyor belt that lowers down and you put material into there so you throw in your food waste and it gets chewed up into small particles and spat out into this big hopper and the same with any branches uh any uh, uh vegetation um waste wood materials that come from the town um that's also chopped up macerated chopped up into small pieces and sprayed into this hopper and mixed with the food waste. So we've got something that's quite high in carbon with something that's quite high in nitrogen. And it's left in this hopper for 48 hours and the temperature will rise to 70 degrees centigrade. That temperature when it's too hot to keep your hand in the compost. After 48 hours, we can be sure any pathogen organisms, disease spreading organisms, any seeds that are in that compost will have been neutralized. Now, to be able to sell this commercially, we have to take a sample of each batch, send that to the laboratory to be tested, and then that gets a, a, a kite mark, a pass, pass 100. Um, the compost isn't quite ready. We know then that it's disease free, but it hasn't the biology, the bacteria, the nematodes, the protozoa, the amoebas and everything else, haven't had a chance to break it all down yet. All we've had is the, the, the quick moving thermophilic bacteria, the ones that create all that heat. They come in first, and now we're going down, the compost is going to cool down, and we move it using a tractor to the other side of the factory, where actually you can just see there's a series of one, two, three, four, five bays, and each week, um, the, the end bay is emptied out. There's a picture here. Uh, not quite. Um, and then it's moved on. So turn, turn, turn. By the time it's been turned five times, the compost is ready. Process takes five or six weeks. So this is a um, industrial size compost making factory. And what it's done is they've identified the waste streams from the town, food waste, and this high carbon kind of woody waste. It's not really good enough for fuel. It's not good enough really for um, construction. So instead we're gonna use it in composting. So we've done the analysis, we've asked ourselves the question, what's available locally? How do we combine them together to produce high quality compost? Okay, now, um, we were shown this backyard I came with a group of permaculture students in 2010 and we suggested to the organization that they wanted to know what to do with their backyard. They wanted to start a garden and then employed a gardener to, to do it, but they, it hadn't really worked, it cost too much money, the productivity wasn't high enough to be worth the, what they were cost spending and they're only really cultivating a small part of the garden. So we came along with a kind of different approach. We thought, well, as permaculture designers, we need to capture store the energy of the community. We need to build teams, energize the local community to see a vision that this space could be a wonderful garden. And um, 
we can, there's two real ingredients we need to make a garden. One is we need to build the fertility from compost, well, it's a compost factory, and we're going to need water. And, oh, look, there's a big metal building. We can catch the water off the roof, store it in tanks, gravity flow it into the garden when we need it. We can, if we've got compost and we've got water, even this soil looks dead and compacted, we can bring it back to life with the, the life that's in the compost. So there's our team of uh, permaculture designers um, sat by a little water attractment area. So there's a the first bit of, of, of uh, wildlife enhancement. And here we are considering the options for the garden. And from that, the students began to make um, plans for raised beds. Um, they thought about the size of the beds, the placement of the beds, the function of the beds. We thought about access path. This yellow here is the a pathway. Um, we thought about a space for people. We thought about a, a, a support, an enhanced area for plants. Um, and we started to think about space for short-term, medium-term, and long-term growing plans. So usually your first plans are fairly sketchy or visualizations, and then we add layers of detail. So here in this garden, we wanted to bring together our permaculture principles. We wanted long-term trees. We wanted tree crops, fruits, and vines, and climbers, and shrubs, and berries. And we also wanted lots of raised beds for growing annual veg. Um, we, then, we also thought about the sequence of things that we might do. So what would we do first? Week one, week two, week three, week four. So we're not going to achieve all of the goals of our project. It's very easy to draw a nice picture like that of what we would like it to look like. How are we going to get there? Could we run some courses? Could we offer training to local residents in the skills that they might need to help build the garden? or skills that might help them appreciate the garden, to see the potentials of it. So we try to use permaculture design as a visioning and team building um, tool. Um, we brought successive courses there. And as we develop the garden, each element that we put in the garden, something we can study, something we can learn from, something we can use an example to recruit more volunteers. Um, here's how working with the student group and learning by studying the, the elements of the garden that we're building, we're maximizing the yield because the knowledge yield, that learning, you know, if you do the same thing every year and repeat it, you're not really learning much. If you push yourself, let's try making raised beds, let's try different composts, let's try compost teas, let's try different varieties. As we learn, we might have some successes, we might have some failures, but those in, in themselves teach us and it gives us more knowledge than to use, to share with our communities. So think about how everything is a resource. Here, uh, Emma is doing some pruning on fruit trees. And again, it becomes an educational thing. It's something to discuss with students and learn from. Um, these are pickles and ferments ways of catching and storing the yields from the from the land um and then here's the garden um only two years in we brought the soil to life we created a patchwork complex sort of mixture of of, of growing and plants and in the process we made many friends and and and, and built a team now Interesting, this is part of a story was um, this garden came about through a kind of mutually beneficial relationship. Um, it was actually an ex student of Sector 39, uh, was working at the compost factory, invited us there to come study it. The idea to build this garden came from that. The building of this garden inspired the Kumhari organization to go away and write a funding bid for which they were successful as a, a, a funding stream in the UK that comes from the National Lottery. It's gambling, basically. Um, but they fund sort of community ventures. We were lucky to get some funding to run a three-year project, which we call Get Growing. Um, 
and that only really came about from the lessons learned and demonstrated from building our first garden. So it turned out, you know, the garden was small, it was in the wrong place, and we didn't own the land, and we had to take it down. But in the process of building it, we learned enough to start a whole new project and be able to move to a new place. Um, this is um, the sixth form college. This is a further education um, college. It's where lots of 16, 17, 18, 18 year olds, where we go and study mechanics and carpentry and hairdressing and food skills and so forth. And this little patch of land here, three acres with a couple of buildings, belong to the college but they didn't know what to do with it they didn't have a clear plan and they they didn't want the responsibility of managing the land and this was just about the time that um we successful with this grant and then that opportunity came about to start a permaculture and horticulture demonstration and training center next door to the college so again, think about mutually beneficial relationships is we could grow food and herbs and produce that might be useful for the college. There's the housing association here. We could provide activities and training, perhaps some of the local residents. Um, and we could build a garden that's productive and good for nature and something that we can learn from and hopefully something that becomes an asset to the wider community. Now, this is what we've done in very specific examples in the UK. But you'll have similar opportunities where you are. They'll look different and they'll, man, you know, there they, 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 they might be a different combination of opportunities, but for sure they're there. There's always unutilized land. There's always unutilized resources, uh, uh, compost and water, and, and, and there's always unutilized people with a bit of spare time or, you know, and if you can create the right soil biology, you can bring any kind of soil back to life, remember? Um, so knowing that we can have confidence, you know, we brought life back to this yard. There it is. We put life back to that yard. There was no soil there. It was just been, it was, they've been parking lorries and turning cars around there for years. It was rock solid. As we, developed the garden as we brought the life back into the soil. Um, it became incredibly productive. In fact, it was really amazing how quickly that happened. So it's about getting it right and the system builds on itself. So um, we started off our new horticulture center with a course. We did some training and then we invited our trainees to start designing and uh, the garden and um, using the things that we discussed on the training. Uh, here's some of our early uh, uh, participants. Um, we started because we had a plan, we had a design, we could then engage the volunteers in the process of building the systems that are going to catch and store energy, you know, trap water, convert you know, uh, compost into soil microbes. Um, we built our wonderful hugel beds, which I showed you last week um catch and store energy you know using the available resources to create an uh, intensive growing systems um and growing systems that actually once established need very little maintenance um we've got a fantastic yield from this uh Hoogle system um here's again working with students establishing our food forest so we're studying learning gaining practical skills and building a garden that benefits the community at the same time. We call that stacking functions. So begin to think about how the, 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 the insights, the ideas I'm giving you might fit together. Juggle them around and find, find a fit for the circumstance that you find yourself in. We touched on grafting. This is a uh, uh, a course we brought in an expert someone with some specialist knowledge and they're teaching us how to do fruit tree grafting and uh, there's different techniques there's different approaches for different types of plants these are things you can quickly learn when you know them you can repeat them and when you repeat them you get better at them 
if you can create your own trees, you can then create your own orchards. And once you've started this process off, you then have the materials you need to keep building and keep growing. Um, as we developed our demonstration and training center, we could build relationships to other teachers and trainers. We could develop the range of, this is a plant ID workshop. Um, and we could offer different trainings, which then might create ways to connect with different segments, different people within our surrounding community. Willow weaving. Willow weaving in the community garden as it develops. So as the, the, the space increases in value, then we can use it in different ways. And by inviting community members into your space, they then begin to be learn about it and become inspired by it. Um, inspired by the garden, we did some outreach into the parts of the community and yeah, help start off little pockets of regeneration. This is back to the Liverpool project. And, um, you know, in a very urban setting, um, high, high density residential housing, um, lots of people in a small space, but still with green areas and edges where we could squeeze in a polytunnel, we could look into the local waste stream and we could access compost from food waste, wood chip from overhanging, you know, clearing overhanging wires. Um, we can combine these materials again to, to build, these are actually we're growing the plants that will be part of our food forest systems. We're growing plants that are good at building soil. We're growing plants that are good at feeding the beneficial insects, um, multiplying them uh, in our dedicated nursery beds and protected growing areas. And as we multiply the plants, We've then got them to plant out and then take out across the community, engage with people close to their homes, where they are, give them some introductory skills. This is how permaculture works. It's, it can be very difficult to do community engagement. Um, if you just go and knock on doors, people don't want to talk to you. What we found is there's always a way in. This lady here on the left, she was the kind of community matriarch and she came and had a word with us and she liked the idea of a planting a community garden and because she liked the idea everyone else on the street came and participated so you've got to find your way in there's a lot of skills to working with community working with people but there's if we can unlock that energy of people then we can achieve so much um so here's us look establishing productive food plants in little orchard groups, plant guilds um, here on the edge of a bus terminal, you know? So can we bring beauty? Can we bring diversity? Can we bring productivity into the cities, into community, community areas? And can we do that in a way in which we make new friends, in which we make new connections, in a way in which we add value to the produce that we're making by fermenting it, making it into jams and preserves, cooking it into different meals, um, teaching people the skills about um, beekeeping and, and, and plant rearing, um, creating community events where people can share their new knowledge. To me, all of this is permaculture design. So this is Squash, this organization, Squash Nutrition, was so good at using arts to engage community to make it attractive and cooking, um, you know, just simple processes. I love this poster. You can't buy happiness, but you can buy local. It's kind of the same thing. If we buy local, we create a strong local economy. We can, more that we can have our own local produce, we can be generous with it. We can use it to build relationships, to support our own needs, but also support community needs. Um, yeah, you know, I've punctuated my life with doing 
intensive two week permaculture design courses. Here's a poster from one from 2013. Uh, going back a few years now, 10 years ago now. <laughs> um, but it's a great way to meet people. It's been a great way to build a strong social network, a great way to uh, grow uh, skills. And, and it's taken us to many different locations. Um, so here we are working with a local landowner up on, he lives up high in the hills, this guy. And we're introducing, here we go, here's our fruit trees. We're thinking about a succession of plants that could add yields and add productivity to this system. Uh, another community garden, another teaching endeavor, another group of people brought together around common themes. Derelict places, on the edge, urban edges. You know, if we can build teams around it, we can create a common vision. These places can be converted into productive spaces. Look, raised beds, made fed with compost from local materials. Um, strategic placement developments. There we go. There's a few um, uh, little insights into seeing how the things we've been talking about in theory in the first half of the uh, lecture, and there's some of those things in practice in the field. Um, mainly here in Wales, uh, we have many examples to show you from Africa too, but I want you to see how, how whatever you do is going to look different, but actually the processes and the functions are the same. So that's always the challenge is for you to think how, um, How to, how to copy that and bring that into your own design. I'm, I'm very open to questions. Comments and feedback. Um, otherwise, I'm going to show a few um, more Steve. slides. Steve? Yep. Uh, sorry, there is uh, Udo. He he was requesting to record the session, but I informed him that the session is recorded and is available on YouTube, so Thanks. he'll be able to replay it. And thank just you, to let all the others also know. That is very true, and thank you for making that clear. Yes, so we are we are recording this, um, and we, yes, it, as I say, it's also being streamed live on YouTube. And we will post a link to that as well. So, and you'll be able to also reach, this is lecture six. So the previous five are already there. So, and you're very welcome to access that. And also on our website, I've also made it so that these slideshows are available and you can download them. So you can revise them in your own time or even use them in your own teaching. Um, So I call this sector 39 an invitation for collaboration. So firstly to say, you're really welcome. Welcome to be on our PDC. Welcome to be on this mission and at, to share our mission and share our goal. And I hope that you'll stay with us for the long term. I hope that you will help spread the network where you are in your community, because we believe strongly that permaculture is for everyone and that we could all find these ideas useful. We all eat food, we all drink water, we all breathe air. We're all part of this sort of nutrient cycle. So let's take an active role in that. So the mission statement of Sector 39, named after 39 London Street, Reading, where you saw that roof garden. Our mission statement is to accelerate permaculture learning through education. And we want to develop working examples of permaculture projects in different contexts. So we're not preaching to you with just ideas. We're showing you, here's the project, this is, here's the application, here's the example. These are the tools, the design tools that we use to create that. So with that, the first two steps of our missing submission statement, we hope to bring permaculture into new areas. And by that, we mean through you to your home to your community um 
we can all learn from each other because every time we do permaculture, it's kind of unique. Something new happens. So um, there we go. Welcome to Sector 39. This is a lifelong journey. I hope to see you right the way through. Um, yeah, we named after 39 London Street. Here it is. And um, there's the original roof. Here's the garden being really well established. There's a community group of people up there meeting. Um, you're seeing there as uh, bamboo plants, there's loquats, there's, um, there's, 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 there's medicinal herbs, there's, I can't, 170 species of plants, something like that. And think what that does to storing rainwater, humidifying the air, habitat for insects and birds. Um, uh, I lived for a long time in the Welsh mountains. I still do, but in a different part. Um, in 1995, we managed to buy a piece of access, a piece of land in this highly grazed, highly kind of degraded over farmed area. And you can actually, you can clearly see this satellite picture is after about 10 or 15 years of living there. You can see what we've done. The You can see the land, our three fields and houses because we've put the trees back. We still maintain open pasture. We've got water, we've got uh, our wetland, um, but we, we've, we've come in from the edges. We've created a uh, wind shelter. We've created um, uh, wildlife corridors. We've created um, habitat, productivity. Here's our intensive zone three vegetable garden, surrounded by wind protecting trees and fruit trees and, and so forth. And there's the, the buildings, old stone, 200 year old stone buildings, um, which we slowly converted to become more energy efficient. We built a community using permaculture and we called it Chicken Shack. Um, I lived there for 13, 14 years of my life before moving on to now a new cooperative. I've been applying these permaculture principles wherever I've lived since the day I came across permaculture. Um, so yeah, a little bit of history, permaculture Wales, we were doing project management uh, from 2005, started doing teaching permaculture about 2006. Uh, after about 10 years of being a practitioner. And in 2014, we registered a company. And in 2016, we were invited to, well, 2014, we were invited to Uganda. In 2016, we started teaching there. And in 2021, we won the International Permaculture Prize for our teaching work. So it's been a, it's been a journey. Um, and one that I think we're just getting going on. We're very much a team, we're a family. Um, since we've been doing work in Uganda, um, I like this. Oops. Um, I like this picture here. Um, the three of us at the back are from Wales, the team Wales, and uh, the guys at the front from Uganda and Kenya. Um, this is from 2018. This was us doing some work in, in a place called Biddy Biddy in West Nile. And here's the wider Sector 39 family. Look, the people that we work with that keep coming back and wanting to you know, involve in our projects are the people who trained on the courses. Permaculture connects you to other people, shared values, shared interests, shared project work, shared ambitions. Um, I hope that we can just grow and grow and become a stronger, stronger family. And as I say, the, um, we're open for collaboration. We're open for partnership, friendship, mutually beneficial relationships. Um, yeah, permaculture is global. Here is a first nation, uh, poet and speaker from uh, native from America. Regenerative agriculture is not only about regenerating soils. It's about healing relationships, healing history, healing the people who still languish in the shadows of the legacies of colonization. So there's a thought. 
plant culture as a healing process. Think of the damage that's been caused by warfare and greed, slavery and colonialism and racism and everything else. What's our healing process? Permaculture makes us realize that we, on certain levels, we're all the same. We all have things in common. Breathing air, drinking water, eating food, part of nutrient cycles, reliant on solar energy translated through soil into food. These are the things that we all have in common. These are the undeniable truths. Organic matter decays to compost. Plants grow towards the light. Water flows downhill. That's true whether you're a Muslim or a Christian, a Sunni or Shia, Protestant or Catholic, man or woman, black or white. Those are universally true. And those are the things that bring us together. And I think that that's what we have to hold in our hearts. And when we understand permaculture is global, but we apply it locally. So here's our Paramithi Cymru permaculture Wales, where we're applying it through our homes, our communities, you know, locally, but we're conscious of this global presence, of, uh, that we're part of a global family of permaculture. You're part of that too. So our current work has been um, to build on almost a sort of random hodgepodge of courses and training and friendships and connections that we've made and to try and bring that into some shape. So I live in Wales, I live in the Welsh borders, I have a friendship with a local farm, it's called Trevlak Farm. Um, I ran a course there a couple of years ago, we came up with some design ideas to build a garden using volunteers that fits the farm, that helps suit the um, uh, other outputs and activities on the farm. Um, there's also a long term soil building experiment. This is this is our garden. It's our mandala garden. This is from a couple of years ago. It's settling in nicely now. And this is where we're going to be doing our biochar experiments, our compost experiments, our compost tea experiments. Um, it's all going to be going on here. We've got green manures going on here. We're trying out a wide range of different ideas and we're going to demonstrate them to you and um yeah and we're going to encourage you to do the same so here we are working locally building relationships with the local farm to do permaculture we're growing food we've got a, a dig no dig system but we're testing out some ideas um we're experimenting with biochar and i'm going to get into that later on because it's a big part of our story it's a big part of how we get carbon in the soil how we add more air into the soil how we create uh, passageways for water infiltration how we create the build the long-term fertility of our soil by creating better habitat for microbes certain ways in which techniques we can use to turn low value waste materials into a stable form of charcoal which when introduced to the soil will stay there for long periods of time and by that I mean thousands of years. It's our biochar that we made from the, uh, waste material on the farm and we'd be started experimenting with that. We'll be talking about that later on. Um, I've touched on our bricks testing. There it is. There's us testing the sap of a, of a cabbage plant and we're slowly learning the subtleties of plant fertility, understanding how Plants are living and changing and modifying the conditions as the day goes on. Um, as uh, When it's rained and the plant takes up more water, the bricks value, the density of the sap of the plant goes down. As the day heats up and uh, the humidity rises, the sap then becomes more dense and the bricks value goes up. You start to tune into these subtleties Realizing how our plants are living and breathing and responding to the environment around you. Um, here's again adding a drop of the sap of the plant onto the lens. And here, working with a, a child, a local friend, um, part of our learning, part of our experience, socialization. Um, the school's giving us a nice classroom to work in, an old converted shed. And off we go. That's part one, part of the stat is the UK 
base of the Sector 39 Permaculture Academy. We also have a training base in Kenya, um, Permo Africa. Um, people that we met through our first early PDCs, here's Paul Agola back in 2016, 2017, and um, Helen Anu, as well as one of the founders of, of UPO, another organization within our family. Um, here's Paul working in the field with us a few years ago. And I think, is that Gerald there? I can't see the back of the head. Um, but look, here we are making really nice raised beds with mulch, beds that are going to ha catch and store rainwater and um, give a chance to build long-term soil fertility. Um, here's the founding of Permo Africa. It's a water catchment feature. Paul was able to communicate his ambitions to his surrounding community and it allowed him to design and plan and build his train demonstration and training center and build a partnership with other organizations so we can demonstrate, educate, replicate and teach permaculture design. So um, congratulations to Paul who's created a classroom demonstration site built it up and maintained it now for, I don't know, we must into five years. Paul tells me in the last three years, he has trained 3,600 people in permaculture. There's 40 people at Permo Africa right now studying this same course. So if he can do this, what can you do? Um, um, how can we inspire each other? How can we support each other? Can we understand that? Again, ideas that were communicated and learned at Permo Africa and then replicated in other locations across the community. This is a satellite project. They're growing Sakuma Wiki um, in raised beds made out of locally available materials. How valuable are these green spaces? Because they bring community together, they provide produce, and they're building soil. You look after these beds, they get become more productive each year. We don't grow them. We don't, so we don't dig them. We don't turn them. We don't stand on them. We just keep feeding them with compost, rotating the crops around, and they become more and more fertile. Um, think how permaculture can bring together different generations, um, how we can build and add value um yeah so um this is another project in wales local project in wales bringing back biodiversity expanding tree cover creating more habitat more space for wildlife interacting with the community adding value creating niches where people can come together this is another farm we've had links with come and talk to us, exploring ideas, how they can bring diversity back to their farm. Um, we have our dear friends in Rwanda, who are the driving force behind starting the Rwandan uh, women's permaculture movement, um, where they've worked at a local high school to design and build a community garden that harvests the rainfall from the buildings and then converts that into high quality food, shade, modify the environment, feed the students, inspire them to see other possibilities. Um, there's fantastic work going on across Teso district. Um, I've mentioned Eastern Uganda permaculture. There's a TAPA, Te Teso advanced permaculture. Um, uh, uh, and the amazing work they've been doing there with the mud stoves, the Lorena stoves, fuel efficient stoves that don't produce smoke, reduce the amount of energy out of the amount of wood you're using by up to 80%. Um, here's Ali Tebendeki, another member of our team, um, who's also teaching. Look, this was a slideshow we put together a couple of years ago, a little while ago, but um, to see how permaculture manifests itself. We share common values. With those common values, we can build long-term goals. And if we can agree about our values and our long-term goals, 
And it's simply a matter of breaking those goals down into stepping stones, into strategies, into activities, understanding the process that we need to go through to achieve our long-term goals. We have to be able to come together as a group and agree on those core values and informed by those values, those long-term goals. If we can do that, there's nothing we can't achieve. Um, we can bring people together to make them understand and feel that they're part of a team, that we're not in competition. We're sharing, we share the same long-term objectives. There we go, we've got a few minutes for questions and feedback, any comments or anything. Uh, super interested to hear any thoughts that you're having, anything you'd like to share. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, Wood had a question about uh, whether we have any links in Nigeria or whether we have any uh, any links in Nigeria. And then, uh, Steve? So I'll keep my camera on so you know that I am here, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, Udo had a question whether we had any practitioners or links in Nigeria. We will find out for you yeah. and we, we can do a search. I'm telling you, yes. I don't know the links, but they will be there. Permaculture is in every country. There will be pioneers, there will be people starting off. We'll try and help them find them for you. Okay, and Ali has uh, his hand up. Go on, Ali, unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for this wonderful um, sixth uh, episode of this permaculture design course. Actually, it is very exciting. It's very insightful in a sense that it is really eye-opening and then also reorienting some of us. And um, I really appreciate this. And for the new for the new pioneers, Sector 39 is a body that embodies all of us, not only in your particular country, not in even your community, but it's a network that helps to, to build the cohesion that we all seem to like. And I'm glad that uh, Nicholas Ora, I'm also with him in one of the programs as well, I'm glad that he's also watching and he's attending. And I would like also to thank Caroline Olang, Hilda Warumbe. I do believe that uh, she received her vetiva a week ago. Um, and everyone who has been attending to this is really super. Jerry, thank you so much for moderating and ensure that everything and communications, everything goes well. Steve, thanks for leading this. We are behind you. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for that, Steve. Ali. Very welcome comments. Thank you. And um, yeah, you've inspired us as well so much with your work and your continuing work. And as we move later, later, uh, longer, later into the course, I'd love to have, you know, for you to share and talk about some of what you're doing at, at Butambala. And I'm sorry I didn't say more about it earlier, but I just wanted to to name check you at least. Okay, thank you so much. Tebandi uh, Keali is my name. Uh, uh, some of you that don't know me, uh, I'm the lead designer for Tambala Permaculture Learning Center, where we are trying to help the vulnerable small scale communities to transition from conventional agriculture to regenerative agriculture by use of permaculture approach. So the whole idea here is that people in Butambala we are used to you know, using plastic chemicals to fertilize their soils. They used uh, poor farming methods to ensure that they produce yields, which was busy deteriorating because of the climate change. And it's my native village. It's where I was born, but 
my hometown is in Natete, where we are doing the, the regreening project, and uh, which is known as Natete Green Youth Organization. So that was my first project after doing my PDC. Uh, it was one of my first project to do for urban settlers. So it is the urban project for permaculture that I am doing as well. So we have now produced more than 200 people that are now busy spreading the word as well as helping people to grow food in urban centers of Natet and beyond. So at the Tambala, what we do, uh, we do village savings and loans association or micro lending. You have mentioned about that. We are also training PDCs at the center. And then we also doing poultry, that is chicken coop, where we are trying to conserve uh, the native chickens of Uganda. So we are also doing that. Then we are also doing warm farming. We are doing uh, vegetable growing, food forest systems, and then also water harvesting systems, and also making of our own pesticides and fertilizers. We are also practicing IPM. In other words, we are doing the agroecology by the help of permaculture approach, because we do believe that once we involve the communities in our work, we are building wide and wide. At the same time, we continue to inspire more people we also work with some schools where we have children as well that are also participating to our programs. So um, I really welcome every, uh, for the newbies, I really welcome you on this journey. Uh, don't stop, permaculture. We need it more than ever before if we are to create the world that is beautiful to be in or a better place for us to live in. Permaculture is the solution. However much we talk about climate crisis or we talk about climate change, but if we don't put these things into practicals of our daily life, then permaculture should be the answer. Thank you so much, Steve, for bringing me on the spotlight. Thank you, Ali. Great words. Okay, we're uh, into our mo final moments, really. So uh, any other just um, comments? <laughs> Oh, Simon has his hand up. Yeah. Go on, Simon, unmute. Yes, I want to appreciate everybody for the contribution that he or she has made on this session. Uh, I'd wanted to add on the IPM pest management method on the Cultural one, one would do. Uh, go, I would have uh, advised somebody to go on a early plunge. By so doing that, it enables him or her to do his or her work at a right time before the breeding range of the pests and the diseases. Uh, and then the other one is, I would have encouraged someone to practice mulching. Culturally, mulching creates a very good environment that prevents some of those pests and the diseases outbreak. And then suddenly I would again focus on crop rotation uh, that also encourages us to break down the life cycle of those pests and those diseases and eventually it will help us to control uh, their life cycle and the break out. And then the other one is on deep plowing. One would do deep plowing in the sense that it helps to overturn on the out on the eggs 
of those pests that would have been left breeding into the soil. And then the other one is early weeding. When weeds are properly maintained, the access of those pests and the diseases would not be as so threatening as compared to that person who has not maintained or who has not weighed on his crops. Uh, that is what I wanted to supplement on the cultural methods of IPM. Uh, and then the other one is uh, to focus on the pests. Uh, pests would be categorized in two times, where one would say we have got the field pests and then we have got the storage pests. All of those can be both maintained by the, all the three systems of management where we talked of the chemical, uh, cultural, and then the mechanical methods of pest control. Uh, so when we go to the field pest, we have got some amphids, we have got some amphids that are sometimes hard to be identified by farmers when their crops are attacked by them. And then the other one is on the, is on the rodents. Rodents, this basically rats and others. When we talk of caterpillars, caterpillars, armyworm, uh, mostly on armyworm, when the temperatures are too high, the range at which it eats on, on a plant, it tends to be very high. So, such a pest is very hard to identify at the field level. Uh, I would do I would, do, I, would, I would encourage that person to at least use some of the chemical, no, 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 no not chemical, to use the cultural, cultural pest control measures where one would have used, would use a, a mixture of red paper, red paper, mixture of red paper and the, onions, extract from onions, added with the one piece of a matchbox of blue soap. Uh, it will help on the control of, in the control of armyworm, where he or she has to ferment it for three days, and then he applies it wow thanks so much simon that is so you know a very good insight yes uh, i guess from that from that explanation you have uh, an agricultural background uh, okay that's brilliant um and uh also i i suppose you are you coming from northern uganda Kulu? I am in Eastern Uganda. Eastern Uganda. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's brilliant to have you. And I think <clears throat> the connection has been so good. So we'll have uh, we'll have a, a bigger session. And uh, soon in our next sessions, we'll be having breakout rooms. And we will be really, you know, interested to have you know, deeper conversations. I hope I didn't cut you uh, short, did I? No. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone. Maybe just as uh, one of the common saying, uh, there is one of the common phrases we always use. If the flower is not doing well, 
let's not fix the flower, instead fix the environment, fix the soil, work on the soil. Uh, most cases we are working bottom, uh, uh, the top bottom. So you're starting with, uh, uh, with the plant or with uh, uh, whatever you've grown. How about doing the normal approach, which is bottom up, start with the soil, which is actually should be the starting point. Then when it comes to uh, compost, um, I should say at least I've had an experience of both the, trap the tropical and the temperate. Um, uh, most of us in the temperate, in the tropical, we should know that we have more than a gift because the aerobic process there is really fast and that's how you're able to quickly do it. That is more than a gift, it's more than gold in its own. In the temperate zones where it's cold and everything, the process is slow and you find probably Steve will uh, elaborate on this. It takes more than four or five times the time it takes. So I don't see any reason why any of us any one of us would not be able to compost or to have very good soil. Unless anyone else has a, a comment or a question. Uh, Udo, uh, do you have a question or a comment? I can see no, you're I, unmuting. Yeah, I, I just want to make a contribution. So, sure, please go on. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm speaking from um, the southern part of Nigeria. And I'm representing Farming Communities International. Okay, I got um, I got the invite for this meeting, but I think I I missed the time because I joined late. So um, I'm just here to to seek for a collaboration because I I see from the mission statement uh, that we have um, a lot in common with um, S uh, Sector Thirty Nine and my own organization. So um, on, on behalf of um, all the directors in, um, on behalf of all the directors in Farming Communities International, um, we, we wanna seek um, for a collaboration to see how we can um, have areas of mutual uh, understanding and, uh, and uh, cooperation. So that is just the point I wanna make. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Udo. And yes, that's that's our mission. That's what we always do. Yes, Steve says you could put the link to your organization in the in the chat. Yeah, and yes, we look forward to that. Back to you, okay. Steve. Okay. Okay. Let Let me try if I can get there. Yeah. Okay. Please. Back to you, Steve. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll try and create a little resource, um, a few links on uh, the page for each each week. And yeah, I'm just saying it's great, great to connect with your network. And I know that you've got members all over. And I think this is a great, great way to collaborate and fully illustrates what we've been talking about. So thank you, everyone, for your attention. Um, I hope that was a good lot of good lot of stuff to think about. So that's the end of yields. We're going to move now to think about systems next week. And again, just get a little bit further into how all of these things link together, how it all works. So great. I uh, will look forward to that. And I, yeah, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>